Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining this talk. Um, today, we're going to talk about inspecting and optimizing memory usage in Linux. My name is João Marcos Costa, and I joined Bootlin one year ago. Um, we work with uh, Embedded Linux with a strong uh, open source orientation. Um, we provide engineering services and training services. As for myself, I'm a trainer as well. Uh, I'm currently living in Lyon, France. Um, those are my, this is my email address. If you guys want to keep in touch after the talk. Um, and first, let me talk a bit about the background of this talk, uh, which is uh, most recently a project requirement um, where the idea was to understand uh, how memory was being used and ideally use as little as possible. Um, for, for the curious, we were running um, our tests into an IMX93 EVK uh, with two gigs of RAM. Um, and the, the potentially most important point of this slide is I am not a memory guru. I'm not going to be selling you any miracles today. Uh, I'm just a humble enthusiast. Um, and uh, overall, what is this talk about? First, we're going to talk a bit about virtual memory. It's going to be a, a kind of a theory part of it uh, before moving forward. Uh, then we're going, we are going to dive a bit into uh, how is memory being used, both uh, from a kernel perspective and from the user space perspective. Um, the third point, we're going to cover memory leaks. I think we all have some trauma on that matter. Uh, and I hope that today I'm going to take something good out of mine and share what I discovered with you. And finally, what if we don't have enough of it? Um, so first, the first point we need to understand about virtual memory is that um, the uh, program in user space is not handling uh, physical memory directly uh, because what it actually sees are virtual addresses, right? Um, virtual meaning that this memory is being somehow abstracted and divided in uh, units called pages. Uh, those pages usually are four, four kilobyte long, even though this is not uh, exactly a rule. There are other page sizes. Uh, you can even refer to this link about huge pages. Um, and uh, once your program tries to read uh, or write to one of those virtual addresses, there is a translation going on in the background. And this translation uh, from virtual to physical addresses is handled by a hardware component called the memory management unit, which is shipped your, with your processor. And this, uh, this component has what we call page tables for each processes. And those, pay, those tables are like uh, uh, some sort of dictionaries uh, used to translate uh, virtual addresses to physical ones. And um, so you can see a bit of code. Uh, this is how a physical page is represented in Linux. Uh, this is by far, uh, uh, I mean, this is a very simplified version of the struct that has a series of nested unions. Um, but here I try to zoom in uh, the interesting fields. So as we can see, we have a pointer to uh, the virtual page that is mapped to this physical page. We have flags telling if this page is dirty, if it was swept, um, if it is being used at all. Uh, and if it's being used, we have uh, even a usage count. And um, specifically mentioned in the uh, translation I was talking about, uh, the index, uh, we also have uh, an integer representing that. And um, yes, representing pages, uh, representing your memory consumes a bit of your memory. Um, in our example, uh, with a two gigs platform, we needed um, roughly 64 bytes uh, for each instance of this page stripped. So to represent uh, two gigs of memory, we invested, it's a better terminology than wasted, but we invested 32 megabytes just to represent this memory, which overall doesn't even represent 2% of our total memory, so it's fine. 
this is not a problem and this is not and this is not is not really a point of optimization right um, I'm trying to draw a parallel with how virtual pages are represented but unfortunately it's not so straightforward um, because what Linux actually sees here is an area a virtual memory area with a beginning with an end um, and an array of virtual pages in between so it's kind of complicated to draw this parallel between how a, a physical page is represented and how a virtual one is represented uh, because there is not a single there is we don't have a single struct to represent this concept right and um, switching a bit to physical memory um, it is divided in in zones uh, depending on if you're running a 60 64 bit machine 32 bit machine um, I'm gonna give you some examples later of how this is divided but we, the, uh, in this point, we are talking about physical memory, which in that case, we can see that it's not quite an homogeneous pool of addresses, right? Uh, and that's, when, that's where we kind of start abstracting this. Um, in embedded systems, it's not quite usual to have the, the concept of multiple processors attached to multiple banks of memories but um, the idea is that to, with virtual memory, we have something that is um, agnostic in that matter because each node, uh, this, this middle part of the diagram, is going to represent a different uh, memory bank and each of those memory banks will have its own zones, right? So those zones are attached to the nodes, to their respective nodes and those nodes to CPUs. And the idea is that you have one node per CPU. This is a bit high-end, uh, so uh, I'm gonna show in the uh, next slides. Uh, we will only have one node. Um, but this is how uh, non-uniform memory access is abstracted for us. So um, you can have information about those nodes and zones in, uh, in this buddy info file in procfs. Um, I have two examples here. Um, first, uh, I got this from a, a board with, with uh, uh, not the IMX93, but uh, an uh, ARM board with a 32-bit machine. Um, and here we can see that we only have this normal zone because we are below the, the, um, the roughly 900 megabytes limit. Uh, we ha only have a normal zone. And uh, for each column of those, well, I'm not going to talk, really talk about a body allocator algorithm, but for each of those columns, we have a number of available consecutive memory chunks of a certain size, and they all have an order. So f let's pick the very first uh, column in the, in the upper example. We have 28 chunks of uh, uh, 40 kilobytes uh, size, which is pretty much only one piece because the order, uh, the N here is zero. And the following example is that we have uh, 13 uh, chunks of, of the double, in that case, uh, of the, the page size, and so on and so forth. Um, this is a way of having an idea of how fragment, fragmented your memory is, uh, because in the leftmost side, you have the smaller chunks, and in the rightmost side, you have the the bigger chunks of memory. So a uh, picture, uh, if I had um, from the half to the right, all zeros and far higher numbers in the left side, this is a scenario where your memory is quite fragmented because uh, the body allocator will not be able to provide big, ch big, consecutive, big consecutive chunks. Um, and uh, so far it seems like Virtual memory only came to make things more complex because I'm talking about pages, but not only physical pages, also virtual pages that may or may not be 4K long. Um, but overall, what virtual memory uh, is here for is actually making things easier from a program point of view because uh, now with virtual memory, what the program sees is just a big uniform continuous address space, right? And uh, overall, each process will run in its own isolated space. Um, 
without really caring if we're talking about primary or secondary memory, or meaning we're talking about uh, our RAM or our disk, because the, this all is abstracted as one. Uh, we can also have features like sharing memory segments, like shared libraries and uh, providing um, a backbone for inter-process communication. And each process, uh, so reading the diagram from right to the left, uh, each process will have its own uh, set of virtual pages that can be shared with another process, that can be private, that are potentially even unmapped, or that were swept uh, at some point. And uh, this translation uh, between the program's virtual address space and the physical memory is being handled by uh, the memory managed unit, unit I talked before. And this unit has some storage capac uh, capacity, so it can store uh, one page table for each process, so it can map uh, in a process point of view uh, the, the, the virtual pages to the physical memory. And, uh, oh, excuse me for a while. So the first half of my analysis back then was to see uh, how was memory being used from the kernel perspective. Um, well, overall, uh, the most intuitive uh, access of memory usage uh, from the kernel are, well, the allocations with vmalloc and kmalloc, where you're allocating virtually uh, contiguous, uh, but not necessarily physical uh, memory pages, and then kmalloc, where you are allocating both physically and virtually continuous memory, pa memory pages. Uh, kernel will also use uh, memory to load their modules. Uh, well, there's also the kernel binary itself. And um, some low-level allocations that are not tracked. So it is hard to have a round number, a very precise number of uh, representing how much memory is being used by the kernel. We can get close to it, but um, some allocations are, don't belong to uh, this logical zone where you could just label it and say this is being used for this or that reason. Um, and well, the starting point is, I guess some of you may have noticed that when you're, when you're having your early boot logs, you have this line uh, basically telling um, from the memory available in your machine, there's a fraction of it that's going to be exposed to the user space and how some of, those, how some of this memory is being reserved uh, before moving forward with the boot. Um, let's, let's zoom a bit in that line. Uh, we have this kind of A slash B syntax telling us, I'm sorry, uh, telling us how much memory is available. We have the two gigs provided by the, um, by the platform, but from those two gigs, uh, we are reserving uh, 52 uh, megabytes uh, for, among other things, the kernel code, uh, read-write data, uh, the, init, uh, the init fragments of, of your drivers. And uh, this, 50, this 52 uh, megabyte reserved region includes the 32 megabytes I mentioned before to represent uh, all your physical RAM. Um, and uh, this is a bit of uh, detailing on, on how are those, uh, what, what each of those segments represent. Um, there is one I would like to draw some attention, which is init, is the initialization code. This will be reclaimed later. So what we are going to see in user space, it's not really this first A corresponding to the A field. We're going to see that plus the init uh, segment that was recovered later. Um, for those who are curious, this is the function that prints uh, this log. Uh, you can refer to that if you are curious on how, uh, if you want to know the details on how each of those fields is calculated. Um, and once you get to user space, we, you can see that this, the total memory available uh, is something slightly different of what is being shown in the, this, in the very first uh, number of this line, uh, because we are summing the init segment that was retrieved, right? And uh, for reference, uh, meminfo 5 in ProcFS uh, has significant information about the kernel's memory usage. Um, 
We, cannot, uh, we can pick as an example uh, the memory allocated by the slab allocator, uh, the stacks um, allocated during the, during the, the kernel execution. Uh, we, we even have uh, how much memory is being consumed to represent the page tables in its lowest levels and uh, the user portion of the memory that was provided uh, by calls to vmalloc. I searched for the corresponding field uh, for kmalloc. I honestly didn't find it. Um, and another aspect, another part of the kernel that takes memory uh, is, well, the binary itself. And uh, those pie charts, uh, they come from really rough numbers. Um, in order to optimize something, you have to establish some priorities, right? So uh, my first approach here to optimize the kernel binary size was to, uh, I needed to find a way to have an idea of which uh, component uh, of the kernel is taking the most space. Um, the first, the, the, the left side pie chart was calculated with the, uh, by, by summing the disk usage of each directory, uh, each subdirectory in the build directory. And uh, maybe it's a bit too small, but um, the, the, the heaviest part, uh, if you allow me to say so, uh, was uh, the drivers. So I ran another iteration of this calculation and uh, among the drivers, the, the heaviest part was the GPU-related binaries, uh, which, by the way, we didn't need uh, for our application. So this was, this was my priority uh, when optimizing the, the, the kernel binary size, and the thumb rule is the less code, the better. Um, I'm going to talk a bit uh, in towards the end of the presentation on uh, how exactly I tweaked this binary size, but let's move a bit forward with uh, memory usage in kernel space, in, sorry, in user space. Um, what is the first approach? Uh, and by, I mentioned this as a first approach because that was my first, um, this was priority to this project, uh, how I, uh, what I used to have an idea of how, which pro how much memory each process is taking, which is PS. Um, PS gives us two metrics, um, which is the virtual memory size, um, I'm sorry, the virtual set size and the resident set size. Um, the virtual set size is the, corresponds to the virtual memory size, um, which is pretty much an information retrieved from a ProcFS. Each PID has its own maps file uh, containing this information. But um, what's really interesting for us and what really stuck to us is um, whenever we were running this kind of investigation is um, the memory that is actually mapped to physical pages, right? What uh, memory that actually represents something in the end. And this is, is what RSS uh, does, the resident set size. Um, the problem is RSS um, will account for shared memory areas um, for, uh, in a way, as if that very same area was mapped exclusively to this project. So picture this, I have only two processes running in my machine. They both share the same uh, 100 kilobytes of uh, definition libc. Um, if I sum both RSSs, I will have more memory that is actually be used because this shared memory will be accounted twice, right? So this is, this is RSS is in that, con in that sense is far better than VS VSZ uh, because it actually represents something concrete, but uh, still uh, in a global point of view, it doesn't, it will not give us the right amount of memory usage. And that's where SMEM comes in. SMEM, uh, which instead of pick information from maps file, it picks information from S maps file. Um, it provides us with two new uh, uh, metrics, which, is, which are 
uh, USS and PSS, where USS means memory that is unique to that process, like memory that is private, uh, allocation that you run with malloc and that are not being exposed to other processes are tracked with USS. And PSS is a proportional fraction of a shared memory zone. So it addresses the problem with RSS, right? Because if I have a uh, hundred kilobytes being mapped and being shared between two processes, PSS will be half uh, for each of those, so it will be 50 and 50. Um, so it gives us a proportional uh, idea of that shared uh, memory zone. So summing uh, PSS uh, across the processes will not be problematic because uh, it is already accounting for uh, only the respective proportional size of, of the shared memory zone for each process. So you won't repeat yourself during that count. Um, it is a quite feature, feature, featureful tool because you can even plot, uh, plot uh, those stats with it. Um, and if you don't, uh, well, usually the idea is that you are going to fetch this data from your target and uh, parse or plot it somewhere else. So the idea is that you can just record the data on your target. It will generate this tarball, you will fetch it and will, you will do whatever you need with it in your host machine. Uh, because when you run SMMCAP, for those who are curious, it will just dump to the SDD out the contents of SMAP's file for each and every PID. So it's quite huge. Um, so the idea is that you just feed it to a turbo, uh, extract it, and generate it on your side. You will not get visually the very same result as in those slides because I did some tweaks to, the, to SMAP, just cosmetics. The overall idea will stay the same. Um, another approach, uh, but far more global, is free command, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, the thing is, free, it, it doesn't provide a, us with a per-process idea of how memory is being used. It's quite uh, system-wide. And uh, it's even a bit confusing because it has two fields that, that for some may represent kind of the same thing, which is available and free. I guess at some point we all asked ourselves what is really the difference. The thing is, um, what we call free, Linux may call uh, available because it's something that even though it's used for some purpose, it can be reclaimed later on. So free, if you will, is gets close to the idea of a uh, memory being wasted because it's not being used for anything. Um, and the overall picture of a health, memory wise healthy system is a free that approaches to uh, ideally zero and uh, at least 20 to 30% of a total available memory, uh, right? And if you wanna have, if you already had the, also the feeling that Linux is eating all of your RAM because um, the used field, is a, it looks a bit too high, the free field looks a bit too low, even though there's not much stuff going on, not, there, uh, there aren't many programs running. Uh, this is just a, this is mostly a terminology uh, question of what Linux calls free and what you uh, intuitively think as what is free memory. If you want to have more details on that, please check this uh, website Linux ate my RAM, which will give a bit more details on that. Just out of curiosity, is the author of this site present in this room? I don't think he is. Just know you were one of my personal heroes. Uh, um, so uh, let's move a bit forward to the optimization, uh, to the optimization part. Um, I mentioned that the approach for the kernel, which may be a bit superficial, um, I'm not going to get the level of uh, the daemon subsystem here uh, as it was presented uh, yesterday. I think the author of this talk is here in the room. I saw him. Well, uh, the thing with uh, the smaller code approach is that you have to think of features in a wide perspective so you can know what you can toggle on and off. Uh, this is heavily application dependent. So the idea for, for my, my 
particular project was removing all support for file systems uh, for IPv6, if I recall correctly, for virtualization, for graphics, uh, for buses that we didn't need. And uh, well, imagine all, of, all those features as blocks and uh, eventually removing all the co corresponding configs that enable them. Uh, also, enabling, um, well, setting the compiler optimization level to tackle size rather than performance, uh, disable debugging. So we started with a config provided by Freescale, Meta Freescale that was giving us a 32 mega kernel and we went from that to an 11 mega uh, kernel. So we, we get to like 30% of the original size, remaining functional, of course. Uh, and the idea here is that we are not only saving space with uh, binary size per se, uh, we are also saving space by running fewer allocations. Um, moving a bit forward, uh, and let's talk about a bit about memory leaks. Um, there are basically three ways, uh, well, three strategies to, to, to identify those. Uh, by using free, you kind of have this binary idea if you're having a memory leak or not. Uh, the problem with that it, uh, is that you won't find the culprit. However, um, if, you, if we dig into each process, uh, USS and or RSS, well, USS is probably more suited to that, uh, you can actually find the culprit, uh, the, the, the process that is responsible for your, for your memory leak. Uh, in this case, I, I run this, this, I run SMEM uh, in my own machine. I fed a Python script that, that was just uh, responsible for doing a bit of parsing and uh, plotting the information. Uh, and this is the memory usage for um, the, what, what, the most uh, heavyweight apps I had running on. Uh, so Spotify, Thunderbird, and Teams for Linux. And uh, I heard some laughs with the Teams for Linux. Uh, sorry about that, yeah, corporate. But uh, I provoked a mem leak myself with uh, quite silly code that was running malloc over and over and filling this, the result of malloc with uh, dummy data uh, without freeing it, of course. So we can see this kind of linear growth uh, of memory usage in my memory process. Um, I can share later on the script that plotted this. Um, and um, maybe in real life, you will not have uh, something as linear as the memory I provoked myself but with enough data, uh, by letting this, this kind of daemon run uh, uh, enough time, you have this approximately constant uh, behavior of memory usage for your regular same apps uh, and this growth for your culprit. And once you find the culprit, you can go even further and use Valgrind to detect where exactly uh, is your, what exactly is your, your program is doing wrong in terms of memory management, right? Uh, not only leaks, but uh, invalid accesses, bad freeing of heap blocks, and uh, there's no need to rebuild your program, right? Once you, you, once you find who is causing this problem, but uh, still it's important to say that it works better with when you compile uh, your program with the GDB flags because uh, you'll be, uh, Valgrind will be able to tell uh, where exactly in your code uh, this memory management error is happening, right? So it's a bit more information that can save you quite some time of debugging. And this is what a check for a memory leak looks like uh, with Valgrind. Uh, it, it, in the end, it provides you with uh, how much bytes have been, how much bytes uh, leaked uh, if they are definitely lost, and directly lost, I'm not gonna get into details of that, but um, in my case, uh, it's pointing to line six. I should have added the numbering for this code block, but um, basically, as you can see, I'm allocating some bytes for string A and I am freeing string B. So I have 
well, two errors here, uh, even though I am only checking for memory leaks. Uh, in, well, in the in the in the um, in my in my example, the actual problem being tracked is the fact that those ten bytes allocated for a string A are not being freed. Um, and um, let's talk a bit about swap as well. Um, even though swap may not be um, a feature that we rely on in embedded system con uh, context, uh, it is important to talk about it because it's, it's a feature directly provided by virtual memory concept because uh, you're abstracting your disk as a part of your memory, right? Uh, and basically there are two ways of free memory. Uh, you can either drop a file system cache, like there's a file that is accessed quite a lot, so you map it in memory, so the I.O. is less expensive. Um, so your system can either drop this cache or it can pick the process pages and move them to swap, right? And there is even, a, uh, there is even the uh, swapness parameter that can be used to tune this behavior, and it ranges from zero to 200, and it basically will tell Linux who is the more expensive operation. Uh, is it dropping this cache or is it moving, uh, moving the process pages to disk, right? Uh, as of now, uh, according to my understanding of the docs, uh, setting swappiness to zero does not disable it, at least in a system-wide context, even though it disables it in a memory control group context. And uh, I leave you with uh, a bit of documentation to kind of support that. Um, we also have, if you don't want to use, if you're running uh, an embed system and you are reluctant to use in swap, uh, you can use, uh, you can use ZRAM, which is, which has kind of the same purpose, but in a better way, because you are kind of investing a small bit of your memory, of your RAM memory, to um, pick those pages from a process, compress them, and put them into RAM, which is overall still more performant than uh, doing this very same operation with your disk. Uh, yes, you are sacrificing a bit of your RAM to enable this feature, so it is, this is also a choice that is heavily dependent on your application. If you, are, if you already have uh, if you already don't have too much memory, maybe uh, ZRAM is a bit too expensive for you, um, but it's overall faster than this basic swap. And uh, sometimes it's a bit too, it's a bit, um, too late. Uh, well, you're already, out of you're already out of memory and you're already out of swap, either from disk-based swap or from ZRAM. And uh, now Linux used its last resource, which is directly kill the process to reclaim its memory. And uh, it even has the strategy to tell which process should be killed, which is basically calculating this badness score. Um, basically, the most memory your program allocates, the higher the score will be. So most likely it will be killed. Um, I'm leaving you with a bit of code uh, uh, to show how is this parameter calculated, which is pretty much summing uh, the resident set size and some other parameters. And you can, uh, the, the, the happy part is that you can tune uh, out of memory uh, killer behavior. Um, this is not really the decent solution because, um, well, in that case, you're kind of, hiding the actual problem. Um, you can tell the killer uh, to kind of leave uh, some specific program B uh, without killing him. You can make a process immune to the out-of-memory killer, which is, and you do that by setting the adjustment parameter of the out-of-memory score. The base value for that is what it calculates with badness, but this is something that can be tweaked. If you set it to minus 1,000, you're basically, the, the, when you sum up uh, the adjustment parameter with the badness score, you have like zero, even in the worst case scenario. 
so in that case, uh, your process is immune to the out of memory killer. Uh, and I repeat, this is not a decent solution because it kind of only hides the problem, right? It says that, yeah, in worst case scenario, leave my main application running, kill something else, um, which can trigger all sorts of runtime problems. Um, well, maybe this was f faster than I presumed. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for coming, and uh, I hope there was this was somewhat useful for your current or future projects. Uh, if you have any questions, you are forbidden to ask about why was I trying to optimize memory when two gigs were available. I will not answer that question. But if you have other questions, I'm glad to address them. Yes. I'm sorry, the, the, the forbidden question? <laughs> Ah, oh, okay, I'm sorry. He asked about the address sanitizer from the compiler. Uh, yes, I already, I already used that myself. Uh, Von Green can be slow. Uh, I, I agree on that. I, see, I just decided to use it uh, for, the, for the slide and for the, the overall for the talk because it's, well, it's what I use the most. And um, sometimes you are tackling a sort of situation when um, it's likely a bit too late to rebuild everything and check for those uh, errors in build time, but even if the sanitizers are still an option, I agree with that, I already use them. Uh, so there is no particular reason why I didn't mention them. It's just that I myself didn't use it a lot. Not, I don't see any problem with it at all, by, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, any other questions? Uh, excellent question because I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, uh, I'm sorry again. Uh, he asked if I ported SMEM to Python 3 or if anybody did. I believe I did that, yes. I just never published it or mentioned that to anyone. But <laughs> yes, uh, in the underground, SMEM for Python 3 is available. So okay, maybe I have some work to, homework to do and publish that. Okay, sure, great. Uh, other question? I think I, I think I went over someone. Uh, Is it, uh, did you ever uh, limit the amount of memory that your kernel was using just to? Yes. Memory yes. Uh, uh, at some point, I for this this very example I was mentioning with from the 32 meg to the 11 meg, I tried to limit it with mem. Uh, in the kernel command line. I was using 40 megabytes, but it was really unstable. I, the, the, it was, well, first it was triggering the out of memory killer, and uh, even I was having kernel panics as well. So the, if, you, if you were the stable limit for me was 64. 64 megabytes, so I was running the app in 64 megabytes. If you guys are curious on how to limit that, it's pretty much just a parameter in the kernel command line. You do like mem equals and the limit that you want. It will, be, it will pretend for user space that you only have that specific amount of memory available. I saw somebody with the hand raised or we're just scratching the head. Okay. Uh, did you try to use this kernel same page merging? I'm sorry? Did, did you try to use the kernel same page merging for taking more RAM? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Use what feature? A kernel same page merging. No. Uh, to be fair, uh, that doesn't even ring me a bell. So, <laughs> so the answer is no, I'm sorry. But we can talk about that later if you will. Okay, so 40 minutes indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.